Okay, so um, a couple of weeks ago, my beloved son and I had a conversation about, uh, he, you know, oh, this is cute, right? Red converts. Uh, this, I was gonna send this to J. Crew uh, model agency, so maybe it'll work crew cuts, right? But, uh, but anyways, we're having a conversation about his uh, Toy Story 3 figurines, gummies. It's like gummy bear in figurines form. Um, and we were on the sofa, and I asked him, I said, Nathan, the conversation went like that. Can I have one? And he looked at me, blinked his eyes and said, uh, Daddy, you can't have one. And I said, why not? And he says, because if you eat too much candy, you're going to get a tummy ache. And I said, huh? And he goes, you don't want to get sick. And I, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, you're right. I don't want to get, and I said, wait a minute. I just asked for one. It, it's amazing how fast they grow up and manipulate you in such a, a, you know, a witty and you know, deceiving way, you know, so clever. Uh, I mean, just a year ago, if it were in the same situation, same context, what he would, would have probably done is basically, you know, threw a tantrum and basically have said, um, no, mine. But now he's three, just three, and he's learned to euphemize rejection. Because when he, now he uses diplomacy, right? He uses diplomacy to say no, but just in a nice way, right? Because he's saying that, really, when I said, can I have one? He goes, no, he doesn't say that. He uses a gentle way to let me down and to reject me. But rejection is rejection. It hurts. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, you get what I'm saying. But here it is. As we grow up, we become masters at euphemizing rejection. Plainly, what this means is we become masterful in having, using excuses, right? Like, for example, euphemizing rejection. Uh, you know, you're in a relationship. It's not going well. And a classic line someone uses is, it's not, it's, that's the euphemism for rejection. What you're really saying is, in your head is, I don't want you anymore. You're crazy. <laughs> this don't work out. It's not working out, right? But what you're saying is, it's not you, it's me. It's a lie. It's blatant rejection. It's painful. But you say it because, what, you want to use diplomacy as an excuse to break up. Because, no, I have issues. When you clearly think they have issues, that's why you brought it up. Or, you know, when you're going to first date, and the girl says yes, and then you call her, but she's sick today. <laughs> Euphemizing rejection. Classic example of it. And so we, humanity, we, we, as we grow up, we no longer say what we really mean, but we begin to, you know, even on stupid things like social networking sites, like Facebook, when people invite us, and they invited a thousand people, we say maybe. <laughs> because we've mastered the art of excuses. And, and maybe means no in Facebook. Never have I ever seen someone said maybe to an event come. It's just a nice way to say no. And I think for a lot of us, as we read Exodus 3, when you see Moses, when God calls Moses to go, and he convicts him. I mean, God's sakes, is a burning bush. <laughs> Moses has a lot of excuses. Just like many of us have a lot of excuses about the convictions God has in our life. Uh-huh. Anyone? So let's, let's look at this text. Go back to Exodus. Now we're going to Exodus 4. And let's see where Jesus is or how God stands how does God ever stand all of our excuses? How does the gospel deal with our excuses? How does he engage the heart with that? 
we're going to tackle that and unpack that with Exodus 4. Let's go here. Um, Monica read it for us. I hope you had a great time in Japan. We hate you. Um, <laughs> clearly, clear rejection. See, that's, there, there's no use. Now, uh, Moses answered God. God said, first of all, in the context, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're new to church, uh, I hope you are. Um, God says, Moses, go. The, the burning bush experience is taking place in Exodus 3. Moses, uh, before this, was a nominal atheist, didn't believe in God. Now he really cannot believe in God because the burning bush experience. God shows up in radical power, um, empirically convinces Moses that God is living and changes his existence. But now God has a purpose for his existence. But Mo Moses, though meets the living God, has excuses for why he doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. Anyone? So uh, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Moses says, God, you know, this is, this is a hard sell. They're going to think I'm crazy. What am I going to tell them? The burning bush came to me and told me, go to Egypt and free my people. I'm going to go, Pharaoh, let my people go. And you go, sure. I mean, it's a, little, it's a little hard to sell, you know. And so that's his first excuse. But this is a crazy story, God. And God deals with him patiently. You, you, you know, Monica read it. So secondly, you know, God answers all that and says, you know, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give you a miraculous power. And then Moses says, okay, fine. Verse 11, Moses says to the Lord, oh, Lord, I have never been eloquent. Neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. He goes, okay, you're gonna, your power is going to come. And then Moses says, you see, I can't talk. The guy's like, you're talking to me right now. What you just said is pretty eloquent, you know? It's an excuse. Moses actually was trained in Egypt as the son of Pharaoh in rhetoric, okay? So just letting you know he's lying here, like God doesn't know <laughs> when he learned. Moses is like, I can't talk. I suck at it. I was the worst of the sons of Pharaoh, which means you're better than everybody else, really. And then, he, you know, after he gives two excuses, he, you know, basically says in verse 13, he, you know, now he, he tells the truth. Moses says, oh, Lord, please, someone else to do it. So these excuses were what? Just euphemisms for no. I don't really want to. Right? I don't want to. You know, one of the things that most people don't understand, whether you are searching for God and you're here because your friend forced you or um, you're here because uh, you, you follow Christ. It's so stupid <laughs> that we have the identical Jesus as Moses does. I mean, right now, God is convicting some of you in different places in your life uh, to follow him. Places he's calling you out of or places he's calling you into, but you go, well, and you have these, all these excuses. You know, let me put it this way. The most, most uh, humorous thing I've read in the last couple of weeks is actually an article from The Post. I actually don't read The Post. I like The New York Times better. It's not because, you know, of any other reason. I think The Post is stupid. That, yeah. I mean, I'm just letting you know. Now, okay. Now, uh, but Yahoo had a featured uh, article on this. Where um, a teacher, uh, a, a, you know, Bronx school teacher, uh, staff member at an elementary school decided to play hooky. If you ever read this, this is really funny. She decided to play hooky for three days, um, but her excuse was that her mother died. But she lied about it. Her mother was not dead. And uh, the problem was she got caught. You know how? Well, on the documents, to you know, uh, excuse your absences, she spelled cemetery wrong. She put, instead of putting St. You know, Mary's Cemetery, she spelled it phonetically to Terry, T-A-R-Y, instead of E. So when the person saw the misspelling, they go, something's wrong with this, right? And she accepted, in spite, on top of all that, she accepted $150 in gift cards from her staff members at school. You know how she got busted? In the Bronx. Thursday night bowling. 
her mom is in league, bowling league. There was, there she was with her mother, bowling. Staff members saw her mom and her. She got fired <laughs> the next day. She got caught and she said, I got, I got nothing to say, right? Ironically, this person's name is Dawn. Dawn Singletary, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, if your name has T-A-R-Y behind it, I, I think you would learn to differentiate cemetery like that, right? And wouldn't it dawn on her that this is retarded? I mean, did it ever dawn on her that this excuse is like, you know, I don't know, maybe just crazy? I mean, what happened if, you know, my dog died or, you know, something less verifiable, you know? It, it is the stupidest hooky excuse. I mean, she needs to watch, again, Ferris Bueller Day Off. <laughs> I mean, learn something, right? But it's too late. She, I mean, she's gone. She's fired. But I think that what, what we need to understand is that when God calls you to a certain conviction in your life, he calls you into or calls you out of, whatever your excuse might be, this is what it sounds like to God. You think you're like, you're all clever. Well, I have a great reason. You know, the Greek word, the etymology of excuse is ex. Causa. In Latin, it means what? It means exempt cause. We want God to exempt a cause that we have a reason because our excuse is legit. I just want to let you know right now, to God, it sounds stupid. It's not like God doesn't know. So today, where is Jesus? How does Jesus, how does the gospel engage our excuses? Well, first lesson we learned from the passage is that what? He wants it to what? Pun intended. Dawn on you how? Dumb it sounds. Your excuses are, stu are dumb. God plays along because God is loving. But whatever your excuses are today, whatever God's calling you to or calling you out of, I don't know what they are. You know your own damn darkness. You know your own sinfulness. You know the places of, of life God's calling you to, the risks he's calling you to do. I don't know what it is, but you do. Don't think it's legit, because deep down inside you know it's not. I pray that the Spirit of God would show you how dumb this is, how stupid it is, and how God is calling you out or into things. He's serious. Now, let's go down. So he wants it to dawn on us how dumb this sounds. Second, uh, look what happens. Moses says, but Moses says, oh, Lord, please send someone else. Someone else to do it, right? Verse 14, I want you to read this one because I think a lot of people have a misconception about God. Um, both sides, red and blue states and globally. But it says that, verse 14, then the Lord's what? Burned against and he said, okay, stop right there. So they went through, you know, God was pretty mad here, right? I mean, you know, people say that God is patient and kind, slow to anger. This conversation is only like 10 minutes, okay? It's not like years. It's not literary. It's 10 minutes. The passage says that the Lord's anger burned against Moses. God was pissed. God was like, because he was, he was, you know, beating around what? The bush, but the bush was on fire. There's no place to hide. He's the, the Bible says he is the consuming fire. He's the consuming fire. I mean, the, there was no bush that, and he burned it up. But he's beating around the bush. God is mad because he's going through all these excuses, and God is upset. He's mad. Now, I want you to know right now, if you've been a believer for a long time and you think you can do whatever you want, God's this cosmic marshmallow in the sky, care bear, he's going to love me, patient with me. You know, let me just say, God's not a pussy. He's not. You go, oh, God's going to love me. God, oh, yeah, yeah, God, you know, God's, never, God's not going to send anyone in hell. Please, it says that he burned with anger. Burned with anger. So the question is this, okay? Why didn't God kill Moses? Because let me tell you right now, if I was Moses, he would have been dead. 
I would have picked another guy named Belzebub, somewhere in Mesopotamia. Why did God not kill Moses? This passage in Exodus 4 is like a boring passage to read, I think. Because there's no ultimate climax. There's no ultimate like resolution. Eventually, you know, Moses, he, he, you know, there's no like, you know, assertion in Exodus 4 that says, then Moses got it and screamed for joy. Says, yes, Lord, I will go. <laughs> then Moses says, oh, Lord, you will kill me. Please do not kill me. I will go. There is no climactic event in Exodus 4. It's very subtle and gradual. It says that the Lord said, I'm going to give you Aaron. He's, he'll be glad to see you. And then Moses said, and then the text says, then he went home. And to Jethro and said, I will leave now. <laughs> I mean, well, there's no climactic moment. Why is that? Well, you see, here it is. God's burning with anger. Why doesn't he kill Moses? Why does he save him? And why does he put up with him? Why does he tolerate his excuses? Grace. It's grace. Wow. Well, it's grace that God burned with anger and withheld that anger. Because you see, grace is the only reason anyone is alive in this planet. You know what grace? The grace of the cross. Because why you don't see a climactic event in Exodus 4 is because God is working out what? Redemption. He is writing the good news. He's writing the gospel. So Moses was saved in this mountain, not because he was good, but because of prospect faith. What's prospect mean? It means future. The cross in the future, the provision of grace for our sinfulness, saved him. It was grace. How are we saved? Retro. You know, how many people know what that means? Retro. You know, think about, you know, retro was in. You know, uh, genes from the past, fashion from the past, retro faith. We're saved by retro faith. Grace. Why? Because how many people actually saw Jesus die on the cross? Raise your hand. You're crazy. <laughs> we need to send you wherever you need to go. No one saw Jesus. No one see, saw Jesus die on the cross. You have faith in the cross. Retro, meaning you look back to the cross. The grace of the cross. The prospect grace and the retro grace. People that are living right now on planet Earth. Why doesn't God just kill them for their excuses? The grace that they might look back at the cross. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Redemption. Amen. That's redemption. That's the gospel. That's the, the good news. Redemptive history is being written at this moment. That's why God burns with anger. But yet, when I read this passage, I was like, oh, he's burning with anger. Kill him. You know, I'm just like reading it because I know the story. But I'm just like, yeah, kill him. But he doesn't. He says, I mean, God is awfully nice here. He goes through all the excuses. He beats around the bush. Moses doesn't get it. And eventually Moses says, fine. It wasn't like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. It was fine. I'll go. It's like, come on. But God is working out this problem in, in, in humanity, the heart of humanity. He's engaging it. He's writing the story. And he's using a man that's not a spiritual giant at all. He's a wuss. That God changes. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had to actually, for the first time, hit Nathan. And you're like, no! He's so cute. So what? He's not that cute when he's being bad. My anger burned against him. <laughs> and it was grace that he's alive. I'm kidding. I mean, <laughs> because, you know, I could let anything go, but he kept jumping on my wife. Because he's a boy. I mean, I, I understand your wild heart. You'll read the book later. But come on. Your wild heart, but he keeps jumping on her like, like body slamming into her. <laughs> It pains, and, and she's like in pain, and she tells Nathan, Nathan, stop. Nathan's like, ah, ah, insane in the member. I mean, <laughs> he keeps doing it, and I, I have to finally, I have to stand up and say, you need to stop this. And he goes, I'm sorry he wasn't sorry. He's just a sinner. Messed up mother. He, he, he's effed up. Seriously, he needs Jesus real bad. And I, I took him downstairs, and I had to hit him. And it pained me to hit him. But it was grace that he's alive. 
And you know why I do that? You know why I discipline him? You know why I, I stop him from letting him do anything and steer him to the right direction from wrong, the wrong path into the right direction? Because I see myself in him. When I was spanking his booty, I saw me. Literally. When I saw him from the back, I saw me. I saw, I saw me. I saw part of me. See, a lot of people don't understand when, when they see God in, in, in Exodus 4, you're beginning to see the motif of God being a father. Because if he was God of the universe, Moses would have been dead, obliterated, annihilated, gone. You watch Terminator? This is it. But he's a father restraining from his anger because he sees the best of what Moses could be. See, a lot of us don't understand where Jesus is in our excuses, where God is, where the gospel is, how it engages it. This is what we learn from this verse. He sees what? Grace. Grace what? Hanging on the cross. The only reason any of us have any time, because why we give excuses is to buy time. You don't want to do it. So you say, you give an excuse. The only reason why God puts up with our excuses with our rebellion or with our disobedience or, you know, us going against the convictions of God in our life is simple. It's because of grace. Whether prospect or retro is to grace. And grace is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. He's being written and foreshadowed in Exodus 4. Amen. That's the gospel. The gospel of grace today presents us with a chance to understand the heart, the father heart of God, who sent his son to die for us. And he wants the best for us. That he wants to call us to a place that's bigger than our small you know, plans, our small pleasures or conveniences. God has the big picture in mind as a father. Today, I want to pray that we would want not, not do what he says, because Moses had a, had a problem with that. Just do it. I can say just do it, but it, you could leave this room and not do it because you don't want to. Consider, perhaps think about why God's doing what he's doing in our life. Whether you're, whether you're a Christ follower, whether you're searching for God. Because God is the everlasting father. He's patient with us because he wants to redeem the best of us. Amen. That's the gospel. Let's stand and pray together. If you want to just lift your hands with me to the Lord, let's surrender. Father, we want to come before you this morning. And we want to pray that uh, you would convict us and show us the excuses in our life that we have. Why, whether you're calling us into or calling us out of things, it's different for people in this room. Why those excuses are being burnt up today. And why you actually put up with us and, and withstand us and bear with us. People, without Jesus Christ and the cross of grace, without the grace found on the cross, we'll all be dead by now. The Father sent His Son because He loves us. And when He sees you, He doesn't see you, He sees His Son. And you see, here's the problem, and this is the scary thing. When you see the cross, the grace given to you in the cross, and you still say no to what he's calling you to, 
or what he's calling you out of. That's a scary place to be because there is nothing more than that. God can't do any more than what he's done on the cross to show you that he loves you, that he's trustworthy, that he has the best for you in mind. So today, I want to pray, Holy Spirit, you bring conviction. Because the only reason why we don't do what you ask us to do is simple. We want to be in control. We want to be the boss of our lives still. Today, we want to give that part to you, Father. And not spit on grace, but to embrace grace today.